if you want to do it, not just look but instrument as well in an ear, you can't use a handheld with any success and probably something on your head's a good option. This way I'm going to be able to get a, a good look straight away at the eardrum with both eyes. Open one eye, open the other eye, both eyes are down the hole. And that quick look will tell me that there is a healthy looking eardrum with a light reflex and I can see the full length of the malleus handle. Now it's often not as easy as that and frequently you'll have to remove a bit of wax. So this is something that can frighten people so you get them involved. I'll bring the wax out and put it there and it will be done with a scoop which is official name is a wax ring but scoop is friendly. It looks like this metal end like that and it feels like this which you will do and then they'll and then before they've had it anyone's had a chance much and in your ear it feels like this and if probably a good idea to just do a little bit more and go around the meatus now that's where your finger would would reach so you know that's not hurting and hopefully you've now got a bit of understanding from your patient who might be a small frightened child and then you can go one further I'll give that back there and look a bit more and probably now I'll look with a speculum as well. What the speculum will do in most ears is straighten the canal even more and stretch it a little bit and you will see more. But in this case, as, and in quite a reasonable number, you will see wax that's not at all far in and then you can deal with it without a speculum. Now you, you need always to the books will tell you that you've got to pull it in such and such a direction. It's always outwards and you don't have to have a formula. You look at the eardrum and then realise whether it has to be up more or down more. So forget the formula, just look and it'll tell you which direction. Now often it helps to have the tragus forward too. Now I've run out of hands now but that's why the patients have got hands. Could you please put a finger up there? And he'll almost certainly pull it, no, not on, just in front of, that's right. And he'll do it a bit hard, you move it back. And that will give me the best view I can get without a speculum. And the other things that matter are, this has got a short handle because you might as well get, you can see better if, you head, head, if your looking gear will let you get closer. A long handle will stick you in the eye, will get too close to your eyes. You hold it like that, not like this because if you're holding it like that and trying to look, your fingers stop you seeing. It won't matter always, but it matters as, if it's at all difficult and the ear's small, it certainly matters. So it's a really good habit. And we found out the hard way that the best control is with three thumb and two fingers, not four, it just gets in the way, not two, it's not stable enough, three. And it should be the tips. If it's here like that, you will still not see as well as you should. You should be able to see down the shaft of the instrument. The other thing is you've got to be safe. And if something happens and the head moves, you're safe if you've got a prop. Your fifth finger needs to rest there. Now it's a bit awkward getting it into the ear if you're just going like that and everything's wobbling around. The trick is to, to, have you, to rotate your hand that way, put your finger down and then rotate it in. And the other trick is to slide it, like on the tragus here, so that you're not having to use, have wonderfully steady hands. When you do get to that bit of wax that you can see well, by shifting your head around to get the best angle, you'll, you'll push on it until the edge is lifted up and then it sort of loosens, it uh, lets go. Because if wax is hard to get out, it's because it's adherent to the skin. And if you can unstick it and then go past with your little scoop and bring it towards you, you've got a much better chance of getting it out without hurting. That, of course, would have been completely unnecessary, symptomless bit of wax, but no pain at all. We'll just talk about briefly about ear speculums. The, the one that goes seems to have gone furthest back in history is that shape and it's got a name, Gruber, I presume it's German. Um, and a lot of them are still around the hospitals and they're made of brass. One of the reasons they're shaped like this is you can plug it into a puffer, a pneumatic otoscope. This isn't used as often as it should be. It, 
if you're looking at an ear and wondering whether there's fluid behind it, like a child has, is it a slightly pink drum from crying or is there a, an acute otitis media? Or is there fluid behind the eardrum, glue ear? If you move the eardrum with, while you're looking and you've got rid of the wax and you've got a really good view that's got extra magnification, you will see if there's air behind it and it's healthy, it will flap in and out really quite quickly. And, and if there's a lot of fluid behind it, it'll still move, but it'll be, much, it'll be slower. And the thicker the fluid, the slower it is. And of course, if there's a hole, there won't be any movement at all. So instead of, especially with children, about one in every three ears you look at without making the eardrum move, you're really not sure whether, there's, whether it's a healthy middle ear or not. By the time you've got used to using this and a bit practiced, you'll reduce the uncertainty rate down to mm, certainly less than 10%. And then if you get fussy, you'll confirm that by using audiology to tell you whether the hearing's perfect and there's air in the middle ear. But in, in, once you've got used to that, you'll get rid of uncertainty in at least 90%. So how does it work? Well, again, you just show it to your patient and say it's air, it feels like that. And you might demonstrate it in your own ear, but you're cheating by putting your finger over the end so you don't make it dirty. And then it feels like that. And the other tip is, it's best if you have it hanging down here so your patient can reach it and, can, can, and then say, can you help me by puffing it? And I haven't occluded, I, I'm not getting any pressure effect, but just the surprise of how air feels up against your eardrum makes it worthwhile doing that. Now again, okay. Now I'll see better, firstly I'll get a better seal by wiggling this in a little bit more. And also, uh, I, I'll make sure that this doesn't move so I can get a much better impression of movement. And if it's not airtight enough, you can wrap a little bit of blue tack around the end. Now this is a skill that might take you 20 or 30 times to using it to develop, but in a medical career that's not much at all, and the payoff is very considerable. Speculum size, it always should be the biggest one that can fit. The shape, it should be oval, and if it's a difficult shape and you want to make it airtight, you use a bit of blue tack. And the other speculums that people would have seen, these ones, which are called farrier pattern. They're designed for operating it. They've often got a beveled end, but they're not actually as easy to use in clinic. Well, maybe, but you know, not much. But the biggest reason I suspect why they're not the standard is because they're not geared up to plug into one of these. If you look at the bit that really matters, which is just the third that's closest to the ear, they should be identical anyway. So mostly in clinic you'll find these, mostly in an operating room you'll find these. The wax rings, as you saw with this, you know, they vary in size from slightly smaller to twice as big. The advantage of the really small one is that it will, you can more easily get under that bit of wax and lift it. And that's the way you can loosen wax without hurting people. But then the small one, if you try and pull it, pull wax with it, is likely to pull through the wax. So often you have to use a small one and then a bigger one. Uh, unless, the, unless the end looks roughly like that, 45 degrees, strong and thin, which I think you can only get with metal, it's going to make life harder. So even if you use a, a different disposable one most of the time. It's, it's a good idea to have something that's made of metal for the difficulty. Other instruments, if you're dealing with a foreign body in an ear, you don't use forceps, especially if it's something like a, a bead or a piece of stone because almost invariably that this action will not let you grab it and will just end up against the eardrum. This is actually easier to use. And of course, what you do is you, if that's the ear hole, you keep, the, you keep it flat against the ear hole and you can go past almost any foreign body and then rotate it around and then bring it out. Again, it's something you can practice quite easily. 
So I'll go, in, I'll pretend I'm going into a gap, I've gone past, I'm well and truly into the deep canal, turn it around and bring it out. I haven't actually touched the wall. So if, if you can see what you're doing, it's a, it's a relatively easy procedure and, and you'll have a success rate far higher than you will have with any other instrument. It's exactly the same in a nose, except you'd use a bigger hook. We'll just go through it from beginning to end. So I'll be saying, I'm going to look in your ear. It will be like this, feels like this. And first of all, I will have done that. Then, I'll, then the other thing you have to learn is if you're going to have to hold an instrument with this hand, it's, you have to be able to pull the ear out and hold the speculum with the other hand. And it should be, it should, you need to, it's better if you're ambidextrous. Now, if you're, going to do, if you're going to usefully straighten the ear canal, you've got to not just hold here, you've got to hold here. So you put a finger in the conchal bowl so that it's touching the side of the skull, you get your, and then you make the other one behind and it's a pincer like that. And you can really get some serious strength doing that. Then you pull the tragus forward, introduce the speculum looking through it, because the only thing that's going to hurt is digging it into the wall. And you can, if you can see what you're doing, you won't do that. And the other bit of really useful knowledge that took me a long time to acquire was how far in is the optimal distance. Now, if you go past halfway, you'll be in the bony canal. Now, you can't stretch that open. It's bone. And the skin's very thin, so you can't compress it. So all you're going to do is cause pain. So you stop short of that. But then you then how do you know that you've gone far enough? Well, there's a wonderful landmark and it's the tiny hairs that you only find in the outer half. The eardrum itself has no hairs and the same skin lines the deep canal. So that's how you know you've got the right distance. And that, you have to do this quite often if, you, if you've got difficult deep wax, you'll be, you'll be instrumenting with this combination. So I've done that. Pull the tragus forward, look through the speculum, use thumb and first finger, two hands, to get it into the exactly right position, and then switched over to just one my left hand, then my right hand, if you, Jason, wouldn't mind giving me one of those instruments, and then you will just go up, and the fifth finger, you can rest it anywhere, on the side of the head, on the edge of the speculum, on your finger, but if you don't do that, you're taking a risk. Someday, something will happen and the head will move, and the eardrum will be at risk unless you've got that steadying finger. You know, it's amazing how precisely you can see what you're doing and, and loosen wax and then, and then remove it. Now, in the outer canal, it's not likely to hurt, but a, a lot of difficult wax will be in the deep canal. And then, this, then that's when this concept of loosening it and lifting it before you try and roll it out really pays off. Why do I know this more than most? Because I've spent a lot of my career dealing with small children. You eventually work it out that you can remove wax from the deep ear canal without hurting people. Really quite useful thing that we've just started to realise more and more, especially when we're dealing with um, like children who have a lot of ear infections, like Aborigine children. If you one of the most effective th things you can do to treat an infection, and I don't mean cellulitis and temperature and terrible pain, I just mean a, a seriously mucky ear that possibly hasn't got better with eardrops and oral antibiotics. It needs topical treatment. And the best topical treatment is rinsing out with either betadine, one in 10, or hydrogen peroxide, 3% and nobody's got statistics to show whether one's better than the other. And if it's going to be effective, you need to use it at least three times a day. Therefore, you've got to empower the family. And nearly always, it's the child. So I will hand that one off and say, can you just see how that works by giving it a squirt and feeling the air? All right. Now, what I want you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is hold it like that. So that will mean it can only go halfway to your ear canal, 15, a little bit less, 15 millimetres, but it's enough to be fairly sure it's going to go. 
Now, can you reach up and put that in your ear and then blow air down on your eardrum? And I'm watching that he's getting it in there. Push your fingers in up against the tragus, that's right. And can you feel it puffing air on your eardrum? Right, so you're nearly there with this do-it-yourself at home. And they love playing with water pistols. And the next trick that I probably don't do in clinic, because if you've got that far and you give them written instructions that works anyway, is to say, well, dry it with water, warm water, and just get the feel of it. And then once you've done that, and you use either peroxide or betadine, you want to say, just put it in and tip it straight out. And that way you'll find out if it's, if it's feeling a bit hot or whatever, and that's the worst you'll get, a bit of discomfort. You see them after they've been using it a week or two and they'll say it's no different from getting bath water in your ear. So your ear gets used to it. They've got a far better chance of getting the difficult to treat infections better. So you've got a dry ear or an uninfected grommet tube situation. Very handy bit of something that you can give to the patient to self-treat.